Now we come to inconsistent statements, and boy, can we find them. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. However, we find out several chapters later, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. Why would they be terrified when the Savior of the world, the very Creator of the world, was walking on water toward them? In fact, if they in fact believed He was the Savior, even God in flesh, they could never be terrified, but should have been overjoyed to see Him during the stormy boat ride. Is this possibly more editorial fatigue? By allowing Jesus' true identity to be known and having the disciples place their faith in Jesus at the start of his gospel, our witness runs a huge risk of not sustaining this trust and knowledge throughout his gospel since he's copying a lot of his ideas from the synoptics. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Here we see Jesus' disciples questioning Jesus' claim that they should consume his flesh and blood. Not much trusting going on there. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? You know, for disciples who had put their faith in Jesus nine chapters ago, right after his very first miracle of turning water into wine, and considering the fact that these same disciples knew full well that Jesus was the Son of God and Savior of the world, it's strange that they would question anything he would say. Perhaps we are seeing the dense disciple syndrome from Mark's Gospel bleeding over into John's. If John copies any of Mark's dense disciple concept, it contradicts his own claim that the disciples knew exactly who Jesus was and put their full trust in him. Not only did John tell us in chapter 2, but he reiterates in chapter 6 that the disciples fully believed Jesus. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And during the triumphal entry scene, the disciples are again struck with dense disciple syndrome. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Then Peter is suddenly struck with dense disciple syndrome when he cannot understand Jesus' simple euphemism for dying, when supposedly Jesus had taught his disciples openly without using parables as John's gospel contains no parables. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Perhaps another case of copying from Mark, but forgetting that the disciples had already known exactly what was up with Jesus. Again, in chapter 16, we find the same disease afflicting the disciples. In a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me? and because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. But wait, didn't the disciples understand only a few verses earlier that Jesus must die? Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. The disciples clearly understand that this going away of Jesus' actually meant his death because they were all filled with grief and didn't have to ask Jesus what he meant. Yet 11 verses later, 
the disciples are suddenly clueless about Jesus telling them, in a little while you will see me no more. Another odd string of inconsistencies can be found concerning whether Jesus will be doing the judging of mankind or whether God will. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. So God judges no one, but Jesus judges everyone. Got it. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. What the? So now Jesus judges no one. I have much to say in judgment of you. Holy cow, Jesus must have Alzheimer's disease. He can't remember whether he is to judge people or not. Now he's the judge again. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. But Jesus, I thought you said, oh, forget it. You've toggled back and forth so many times between you being the judge and God being the judge. I've lost track. For Christ's sake, which is it? <sighs> well, let's give old Jesus the benefit of the doubt and blame this on his witness's apparent Alzheimer's disease or perhaps an exceptionally bad case of editorial fatigue. This is certainly inconsistent, if not a direct contradiction. An X in the inconsistency box, and we trudge forward. Is our witness truthful? The fact is, there are so many problems between this witness's testimony and that of the synoptic authors that even Church Father Origen admitted that our witness was not always telling the literal truth. Although he does not always tell the truth literally, he always tells it spiritually. We've seen how our witness has altered the synoptic accounts on many occasions to include, presumably, himself into many of the scenes that had no disciples present to witness the events recorded. I wouldn't call that being truthful. I'd call it being a fiction writer, improving upon previous fiction. X in the box and we move on. What about direct contradictions? Here is an example where Jesus is recorded as stating not just an inconsistency, but a direct contradiction. If I testify concerning myself, my testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, And if I testify of myself, my testimony is true. Can Jesus' testimony of himself be both true and not true? But is this a contradiction of our witness, or did Jesus really utter two contradictory statements? It looks bad either way, but I am going to let Jesus off the hook this time and put an X in the contradiction box. There's a much greater chance of error in recording what Jesus said when the witness is writing it down a good 60 years after the events, not to mention editorial fatigue and plot holes due to fictional elements. A look at the checklist now shows that all four Gospel authors can be dismissed for being quite unreliable. Any one X is enough, but to have multiple X's shows that these authors were not actually recording real events, but writing theologically based fiction. Even though we already know the witnesses are quite unreliable, let's go ahead and briefly look at how their accounts of the resurrection compare. There are too many inconsistencies and contradictions to actually look at, so I'll just touch on a few of them. Mark records three specific women going to the tomb. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Matthew, on the other hand, says that there were only two specific women who went to the tomb. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. We can give Matthew the benefit of the doubt and grant that the other Mary is in fact the one mentioned in Mark's account. But where is Salome? Is this a case of a faulty memory on the part of Matthew's source? Or was Matthew's source correct and Mark's incorrect? Luke also gives us an account of which women went to the tomb. Perhaps Luke, who himself claimed to have perfect understanding of all the events, can settle the matter. Now, they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna. 
and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, told these things unto the apostles. Luke mentions no less than five different women and seems to either swap Salome for Joanna or mistake her for Joanna. We've now got three different versions varying in both number and identity. Hopefully, John's account could settle the matter of how many and which women visited Jesus' tomb that morning. Now, on the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, while it was yet dark, unto the tomb, and seeth the stone taken away from the tomb. Each gospel author gives us a different account of how many and which women went to the tomb. And even though the accounts do not use the qualifier only when listing the women, the problem still exists because we know that no author would write an account which mentions only one woman visiting the tomb if she was in fact accompanied by two or more other women. These authors understood how to communicate as we saw in Luke's account where he does inform us that there were other women besides those he mentioned by name. If we had merely a confusion of the third woman, Salome and Joanna, or if each account mentioned the women in an unspecified way, as in unnamed or perhaps an approximation of number, we could at least understand it as a small mix-up of names and numbers, faulty memory, etc. Three women could be seen to grow into four. If we were dealing with unnamed women, especially when there's a time gap of 40 to 90 years between the events and the Gospels. But how do you mistake five women for one woman? How do we reconcile Luke's five or more women with John's one? Or John's one with Mark's three? Missing a small detail, like whether Mary was smoking a cigarette or not, would be understandable but reporting only one woman, when in fact several were present, is unexpected. And we are hard pressed to come up with a good explanation other than the one I've already suggested, which in case you've forgotten, is that these authors were writing fiction. As there was no resurrection or any events that actually happened, they were at liberty to create the details and modify the previous gospels as they saw fit. Apologists may say that we can be sure that at least one woman went to the tomb or that a divergence of details is to be expected or they may even concede that the accounts are in contradiction but that how many women went to the tomb is not an important detail. What's important is that Jesus rose from the dead. But this misses the real problem and that is whether the accounts as a whole are generally in tune with each other or not. We cannot trust a resurrection claim when the very people telling us this cannot even get the obvious details correct. Also, it is easy to dismiss one difference as unimportant. It is harder to dismiss 20 or 30 differences as unimportant. For you then are dismissing most of the resurrection account as unimportant in order to retain that one important detail, which all four Gospels do agree on, that Jesus came back to life after being dead for several days.